To all who are weary and need rest, to all who mourn and need comfort, to all who feel worthless and wonder if God cares, to all who fail and desire strength, to all who sin and need a Savior, this church opens wide her doors with a welcome from Jesus Christ, the ally of his enemies, the defender of the guilty, the justifier of the inexcusable, the friend of sinners. Welcome. Well, hello, church family. It's good to be with you this Sunday. I consider this a tremendous privilege to uh, bring the Word of God before you today. It's very humbling, and uh, I'm excited. So we're going to continue in First Peter. Uh, by the way, Steve is at Nordonia, if you were wondering, so you got to put up with me this week. Um, but he's doing a great job over there, and uh, we're going to rely on the Holy Spirit over here. So uh, with that, I'm going to go ahead and read our passage. We're going to be in 1 Peter chapter 4, and we're going through the first six verses. So if you want to turn to 1 Peter chapter 4, I'll go ahead and read, and then we'll pray and we'll get started. Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. For whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, so as to live for the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. For the time that has passed suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do, living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and lawless idolatries. With respect to, the, to this, they are surprised when you do not join them in the same flood of debauchery, and they malign you but they will give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For this is why the gospel was preached even to those who are dead, that though judged in the flesh the way people are, they might live in the spirit the way God does. Let's pray. Father God, you are holy, 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 and uh, you have shown us incredible mercy in calling us to yourselves, calling us your bride, redeeming us, and uh, making us part of your family. We thank you for that, and we thank you for your word and uh, your revelation to us that we know we know who you are, we know how you are, we know the things that please you and the things that don't, and uh, we can just step back and trust your word and trust that you are good and you are sovereign. So lead us today. Uh, everything that I say, may it be your words, not mine, and... Um, Thank you for this time in Christ's name. Amen. All right, so a little bit of reminder of context, where we're at. We're in 1 Peter, uh, and it's important to be reminded of who Peter is talking to. He is uh, in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 1. It says, To the elect exiles who are of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. So he's writing to elect exiles. Those are, those are Christians in the world who have been dispersed in all these different areas of Asia Minor. And he calls them exiles because they are exiles in the world. When we are, when we are born again, this isn't our home. Our home is with Christ in heaven, and ultimately the new heavens and the new earth. And so just as the Israelites went into exile in Babylon, God sent them into exile. They were in a place that was not their home. So we are. This is not our home. This is not our final, our final place. Uh, so that's who he's writing to. He's writing to Christians um, and uses that imagery of being in exile uh, in this world. So starting in verse 1, it says, Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh. we got to stop right there. Because the first two words, since therefore, imply that there's something before, that came before, that uh, introduces, that is the reason that we're supposed to, to pay attention to this. So we got to go back a few verses to uh, chapter 3, just a few verses up, uh, starting in verse 21. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the re resurrection of Jesus Christ, here it is, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God, 
with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. Okay, so that's the setting. Everything has been subjected to Jesus. He died. He paid for sin. He was resurrected. He now sits at the right hand of the Father. He is, he is Lord, whether he is acknowledged as Lord now or later. He is Lord. Everything is subject to him. And Christ suffered in the flesh, right? He went to the cross for sins that he didn't commit. He went to the cross for our sins, to pay for our sins, to be the atonement for our sins. We could never, ever pay uh, the wages of sin as death. And he paid it for us. And so because he is Lord, because he now sits in heaven, it says we are to arm ourselves with the same way of thinking. So what is the same way of thinking? Well, first of all, it says to arm yourselves. This idea of arming yourselves is like taking up arms, like putting on armor. It's imagery of of warfare and battle. To arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. So what is the same way of thinking? I propose uh, that the same way of thinking is a willingness to obey God when doing so may result in physical or verbal suffering. Physical or verbal suffering. I'm going to take you back. I didn't make any slides. I'm sorry about that. But So we're going to pretend it's 1990 and we're going to turn in our Bibles to uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, and we're going to start in verse 21. We're just going to look at this briefly because I think this influences what the same way of thinking that we are to arm ourselves with uh, is. So chapter 2, verse 21. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example, so that you might follow in his footsteps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. So the point that the same way of thinking is a willingness to obey God when doing so may result in physical or verbal abuse. We see that here in verse 22. The first one, he committed no sin. He was was punished for our sins, for the sins of the world, but he committed no sin. Neither was deceit found in his mouth. He didn't lie. He didn't lie to get himself out of out of suffering. He always took suffering. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return, right? When we when we are reviled for our faith, whether it's for our faith or anything else, our, our gut instinct is to, to talk back, to maybe revile or give some snarky comment. Um, we don't like being attacked verbally. And so we get defensive and we get we get on the uh on the offense and try and switch it around on the other person. But Jesus didn't do that. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. He did not repay evil for evil. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. And Christ is the perfect God-man, right? He was, he was completely, fully God, and completely fully man. And he suffered and continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He knew that nothing was going to go unpunished. Everything was going to be made right. God is just. He's a just God. No one gets away with anything. And so I think that these, these four things, he committed no sin, deceit found in, no deceit was found in his mouth, He did not revile. He didn't take revenge. And he continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. I think that is the the, uh, the same way of thinking that we are to uh, arm ourselves with. We ought to be willing to suffer because, again, 
Jesus, who is Lord and everything has been subjected to him, this is what he did. We deserve, we deserve everything that he went through, and yet he took it for us. So if he's our example, we ought to be willing to suffer. But I think that also there's another aspect to the same way of thinking. That the same way of thinking is looking forward with joy to the glory to come. Find that in 1 Peter 1, 3 to 4. If you want to turn to 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. Right? So if we are to look forward with joy to the glory to come, we can keep our eyes focused on this, this living hope in verse, verse 3. He has caused us to be born again to a living hope. We have a living hope that the world doesn't have. Remember, we are elect exiles if we are in Christ. This is not our home. We have a living hope that the world does not have. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. We have an inheritance. Everything that belongs to Jesus, everything that Jesus has inherited in eternity, we inherit with him if we are in Christ by faith. So we can go through suffering and look forward knowing this isn't going to last forever. I can I can endure reviling, I can endure name calling, I can endure any type of physical suffering. You know, we don't we don't really endure much physical suffering for our faith here in the West, but believe me it happens elsewhere. Another reference to this is Hebrews, you don't have to turn there. Hebrews chapter 12 verses 1 to 2. I think reinforces the same way of thinking that we are to arm ourselves with. Hebrews 12, 1 to 2, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, right, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Right? The Son of God, the second person of the Trinity, went through suffering. He suffered unjustly, keeping his eyes on the joy that was set before him. He endured the cross. The, I mean, like, just picture that. The creator of the universe became flesh and bone. And he endured the cross. He endured intense, intense suffering and kept his eyes focused on the joy ahead. Ought we to do that as his followers? Moving on in the passage, second part of verse 1. For whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. I'm going to be honest with you. This was a tricky one for me. (laughs) Peter is not saying that Christians are perfect and do not still sin. I'm great evidence that that is true. Rather, he is saying, ah, I heard that. <laughs> Rather, he is saying that Christians are, not lo- are no longer characterized by sin, sin patterns, or lifestyles. Remember, we are no longer, we weren't always in Christ. We used to be dead in sin. We used to be characterized by our sin. 
by our sin patterns, our sin lifestyles, whatever, whatever uh, the, world, the world lives like, they're outside of Christ. And we, at one point, were outside of Christ. That was us. Even if you were converted at a young age, at one point, you were an enemy of God. And God brought you into his family. Now, I think what this is talking about is really that going back to to verse 1, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking for whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. This is, again, that willingness to suffer. We have to transform our minds to be willing to suffer and to keep our eyes focused on the joy, the glory to come. We need to do that because we're sitting ducks to Satan without it. If we don't, if we don't renew our minds, if we're not constantly in the Bible every day. This is this is challenging for me. I'll I'll be honest. Um, I I work a full time job. I'm in school full time, and uh, uh, the little bit of free time that I get, I <laughs> I want to myself. And um, we we've got to be. We've got to be armed. We've got to be armed with this way of thinking or we, we will be taken down by Satan. That's when temptation can grow and sin can grow. We need to be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Remember, taking up arms, arm yourself. Arm yourself with this same way of thinking, willingness to suffer, focused on the joy that is to come. Verse 2 so as to live for the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. No longer for human passions, but for the will of God. No. Human passions. Human passions can be a good thing, right? Our, our passions can be, um, can be God-honoring. They can be things like uh, money. We can use money for God's glory. We can use money to build his kingdom. We can use money to bless others. Money is a good thing. It's not the root of all evil. The love of money is the root of all evil. That's greed. The world loves money. I got to say, I was debating whether or not to use this illustration, but uh, Michaela and I have been watching this show I can't remember what it's called. It's something about flipping houses, and uh, <laughs> but it, but it's interesting. And um, so it's these groups of house flippers in Florida, and they go to auctions and they try and get the best deal and they fix it up and try and make as big of a profit as they possibly can. And uh, we were watching last night, and uh, late late at night, and. Um, I, I I just I began to covet. I began to see these these houses, this over two thousand square feet homes, beautiful tile, big open area. And I began to covet. Money's not a bad thing. But when you love it, and it becomes more important to you than, than God or people. You can watch that show and you can see the, the people on it just complaining about the stupidest things. This kitchen's ugly. This kitchen has to go. And I look at the old kitchen and I'm like, that's beautiful. I wish our kitchen was like that. <sighs> isn't, isn't that just like us in the West? What about sex? Sex is a good thing. It's created by God. It's a great thing, but Satan and sin have turned it into something that it's not supposed to be. It's supposed to be this this beautiful image between a, a husband and a wife somehow becoming one flesh, and it's an awesome thing. God said to Adam and Eve, be, be fruitful and multiply. Enjoy it. Enjoy each other. But how twisted has that become in our culture? 
or prestige. Wanting to be noticed, wanting to be known, wanting to be, wanting people to look at you and say, and say, wow, they, he's got it all together. She's got it all together. That's what I want. I want to be like that. I think these are the distortion of these things are what Peter is talking about in verse 2. What are human passions? So as to live for the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for human passions, but for the will of God, I submit that these human passions are contrary to the will of God. These are desires that aren't necessarily innately bad, but when they become everything that you're going after, all you care about, and they're not conformed to the will of God. Those who have suffered in the flesh, I'm not, this isn't scripture, this is my note. Those who have suffered in the flesh have surrendered themselves to the will of God. Just like Jesus. Just like Jesus on the cross, just like Jesus' life, reviled, mocked, beaten, scorned, spit on, the God of the universe endured that for us. Those who have suffered in the flesh have surrendered themselves to the will of God. I, I think about I think about baptism, what baptism symbolizes when we go under the water where Identifying with Christ, we have died to Christ and were raised up a new creation in Christ, born again to that living hope. It's a picture. There's nothing magical about the water. If it were magical, it wouldn't be as cold. Verse 3. For the time that has passed suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do, living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and lawless idolatry. The time that has passed suffices. In other words, that's enough. <laughs> that's enough. Living as a pagan and getting saved, that's enough. That's enough sin. That's enough living for the things that you used to want as an unbeliever. And nothing has fundamentally changed in culture. These are all things that are prevalent in America. This isn't. This wasn't written immediately to an American audience, and yet it, it's like we're reading about Las Vegas. Nothing has fundamentally changed. What about it at work? I know I, <laughs> I, I work a job, full time job, and I'm surrounded by people who don't know Christ, and uh, what do you do when some joke that's degrading to women is going around, and you're supposed to laugh, and if you don't, you don't have a sense of humor. It's just a joke. Or school. Kind of things do you hear in school with classmates? I didn't, I didn't hear the greatest things in school. The world looks to these things for satisfaction, sensuality, passions, drunkenness. We are so prevalent in our culture. Orgies, drinking parties, and lawless idolatry. So, so prevalent in our culture. But the time that has passed suffices. That's enough. You don't need to be doing that anymore. That's the old you. If you're born again to a living hope, remember your eyes are focused on Jesus and the life that is to come in eternity. That's enough. Don't live for those things anymore. Verse 4, with respect to this, they are surprised when you do not join them in the same flood of debauchery and they malign you. They are surprised. That implies that there ought to be a very visible difference in your lifestyle and their lifestyle. 
I know a lot of people at my work know that I'm a Christian. But that but that's okay. You you can you can be a Christian. You can believe what you want to believe. But I mean, you're not going to live fundamentally different than me, are you? There ought to be a very visible difference in the lifestyle of believers and unbelievers. There's no no kind of of contrast there. Kind of what Emily was talking about earlier with the kids. Talking about uh, Levi and uh, Michael and how they may not look the part that they're supposed to be playing. We need to look the part. Our lives need to be consistent with what we profess. We profess to belong to Jesus Christ. We need to live like it. I always say our the gospel needs to be spoken. We need to speak the gospel, and our lives are the evidence that we have been changed by the gospel. Our lives are the evidence that that the gospel is true, that it <laughs> that God really does change us. He really saves us and makes us a new creation in Christ. They're surprised when you do not join them in the same flood of debauchery and they malign you. The word malign here, uh, it's translated in the NIV as heap abuse. It can also mean slander or to speak evil of. It's the... uh, the Greek word blasphemio sounds like blasphemy. That's where we get the word blasphemy. You don't participate in the things that you used to participate in. You used to be fun. You used to like going out and getting drunk. But now you're, now you're prude. Now you're no fun. Now you're just holier than thou. And they'll malign you, just like they did with Jesus. They hurled insults to him on the cross. Matthew talks about that and actually uses the same word, blasphemio. They slander, speak evil of Jesus. Why would we think that we wouldn't, we wouldn't suffer the same kinds of things that our, that our Lord willingly endured? We ought not to be surprised by this. Of course, they're enemies of God. So when you, when you have the Holy Spirit and you're, you're an ambassador of Christ, immediately something, there, there's a defense mechanism there. Believe what you want, but don't, don't live like it. Because if you live like that, I'm going to be convicted and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to feel bad about my sin. John 15, 20 Jesus says, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. Don't be surprised. Don't be surprised when the world maligns you and calls you horrible things and says things about you that are not true. Slander you. Call you self-righteous. Don't be surprised by it. It's going to happen. Verse 5 but they will give account to him, Jesus, who is ready to judge the living and the dead. They're going to stand before Christ. Christ is their judge, our Lord. Remember, everything has been subjected under his feet. Angels, authorities, and powers have been subjected to him. Every, he's Lord of all, period. Whether you affirm that or not, he's Lord. And he will judge. No one gets away with anything. If they repent, their sin has been dealt with on the cross. That's awesome. That's the gospel. On the cross of Christ, if they do not repent, they will experience the just wrath of God for their sin. We don't need to worry about about justice not being dealt. Everything's going to be made right because God is a just God. That's every bit as part of his character as love. He's love. He's mercy. He's he's grace. Amazing grace. He's an amazing God, but he's also just. And he will make sure that everything is made right. Every sin will be either punished on the cross of Christ 
or in hell forever. That's a reality. And this ought to compel us to love, to love the world. And love shares the gospel. Going back to uh, 1 Peter 2, you don't have to turn there. 1 Peter 2, 23. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. Jesus is our example. John 3, 16 through 18 is one of the most well-known passages in the entire Bible. You don't have to turn there either. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And that last verse is... <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, <laughs> that last verse is a sobering verse. But whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. If these people who don't know Christ... If this is their, their destiny, condemnation, remember they're already condemned. It says, is condemned already. But that condemnation is removed by Christ through faith in him. This ought to move us to share the gospel. This ought to move us to tell people what the Bible says about, about us, humans, sinners, and God, who God is, God is holy. He punishes sin. He's love and he's just. I, uh, I remember watching this video um, a while back. It's uh, uh, Penn Jillette. It was probably four or five years ago. Penn Jillette is a, uh, he's an atheist, very famous atheist, and uh, released a video on YouTube a few years ago um, about his his show in Las Vegas. A guy came up to him afterwards and gave him a Bible and just told him how much he enjoyed the show. He thought it was really cool and just gave him a Bible. And Pendulet says in this in this video, I guess it's a vlog, um, video blog, and um, and he says, "I know that there's no God." He makes that assertion. But then he goes on to say, but this guy that gave me this Bible, I'm paraphrasing, but he genuinely cared about me. Because if you believe that someone is either going to eternal hell or not inheriting eternal life, how much do you have to hate them to not tell them? And, he, and he's an atheist. <laughs> and, he, and he has this better understanding of evangelism than I think a lot of Christians do. And I'm preaching to myself, too. I'm not. If we love people, we need to share the gospel. We need to tell them that we're not good. We're not good people. But Christ came for people who are not good. He came and he suffered in their place. If we repent, turn from our sins, and trust in him. Trust in him as Savior. Submit to him as Lord. We're forgiven. Our sins have been put on the cross. They've been paid for. There's no injustice. There's no injustice. Christ has paid for it. If the crime is paid for, then we get to go free. Verse 6. I lost my spot. Verse 6. For this is why the gospel was preached even to those who are dead, that though judged in the flesh the way people are, they might live in the spirit the way God does. So who is the gospel preached to? 
Well, according to this verse, it says the gospel was preached even to those who are dead. I think this is talking about Christians who have passed away. They are judged in the flesh the way people are. That's We still experience physical death. That they might live in the spirit the way God does. And again, this is going back to, to uh, setting our minds the same way of thinking in verse 1. Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. Willingness to obey God when doing so may result in physical or verbal abuse. And looking forward with joy to the glory to come. We know that God has the final say. We don't have the final say. Those committing injustice don't have the final say. Our Lord Jesus Christ has the final say. Everything's been subjected to him. So we can endure suffering. We can endure ridicule. And we know that it's going to be made right. No one gets away with anything. That's comforting. I don't know about you, but that's really comforting for me. I, I don't watch the news. I, I get my news from Facebook. I shouldn't, but I do. And you see injustice. You see injustice everywhere. And, and it's comforting to know that God is sovereign and in control of all of it, and no one gets away with anything. So just a few points of application. You don't have to write these down. Since Christ suffered, be willing to suffer. You're going to suffer. No servant is greater than his master. He suffered far worse than any of us ever could. Application number two, endure suffering by looking forward to the fulfillment of God's promises in eternity. This isn't going to last forever. We keep our eyes focused on, on the fulfillment of God's promises, on the fact that we're going to live forever in the new heavens and the new earth, and everything will be dealt with. Everything will be made right. There's not going to be any more tears, no more death, no more sorrow. Everything will be made right in the presence of our Lord. That is our hope. That is our living hope. And application number three, share the gospel. Love people enough to tell them where they're going if they don't repent. This is just basic love. We need to love people enough to warn them. We need to tell them the truth. So with that...